And it is a bit strange that people continue these rituals today without really knowing the origin of just exactly where these things come from. This can cross the line into offensive territory, but this is forewarned in the Bible because the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And upon hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? The physical body and the blood part, that's the symbolic part. But before we can get into this, we need to understand the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient writings containing nearly all of the Old Testament. They were discovered in caves near the Dead Sea in Qumran from 1947 into the mid-1950s. This caused immense anticipation from Christians everywhere as the scrolls were thought to be a guarantee for the church to prove Christianity correct. It appeared as though the only thing left to do was to read and interpret the scrolls and Christians would have all the proof they needed. This was because the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in the Semitic language of Aramaic between 250 BCE and 136 CE. This was the era that the Jesus character was said to be walking the earth. To find scrolls written in his language during the period of time in which he was said to be living was a major finding, and Christians everywhere were excited about this. So, what did the scrolls say? Did they read like newspaper headlines speaking of a Jesus of Nazareth? These were questions that had to be answered. Consequently, the best of the best were called upon by the church for their translation skills. John Marco Allegro was a researcher in philology who had graduated with a first-class honors degree in Oriental Studies from the University of Manchester. He had earlier begun training for the Methodist ministry, but had left to pursue the degree course when he found that studying biblical languages was making him question the foundations of his Christian belief. While working toward a doctorate at Oxford, he was invited to join the Original Scrolls editing team in 1953. In 1954, he became an assistant lecturer at Manchester and considered an up-and-coming philologist in regards to Middle Eastern and Mediterranean languages, Allegro was the only agnostic on the international team of Dead Sea Scrolls translators. Most of the other members of this so-called International Scrolls team were ordained Catholic priests. The work of this team, which was organized by Father DeVoe, was originally supposed to be published as soon as possible and open to scholarly interpretation. John Allegro was the only member to publish all of his translations in the learned journals as soon as he felt they were ready to be laid open to scrutiny. The other members of the team tended to hold on to their allocations for so long that some people, including Allegro from time to time, suspected a cover-up and suppression of the research. In fact, Allegro was asked several times to hold back on some of his translations for several years or face retribution. He sometimes unwillingly complied. If not a cover-up, an unwillingness to tell all, all at once. There always was a feeling that if we go carefully, we can release the information in a way that need generate no hostility or over questioning. But we will do, we will control it. By 1968, Allegro completed and published all of his translations of the Cave 4 scroll fragments assigned to him. In the 15 years since the international team was put together in 1953, Allegro was the only member to finish his assigned duty. 
The remaining scrolls were not published until 1991, when the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, finally released the photographs of all the scrolls to expedite their publication. The other members of the original team held on to most of their translations until after 1997, which was 29 years or more after Allegro, and 50 years or more since the original discovery of the scrolls in 1947. During this time, scholars who attempted to question the orthodox view, as Allegro found out, had their careers destroyed. There is much to learn about John Allegro. He was the only member who wasn't a committed Christian and considered himself agnostic. An agnostic is someone who doesn't believe in nor against any religious philosophy, and this placed Allegro at an unbiased advantage over the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls team. The other men, unlike Allegro, had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo, that Jesus was a real man and that the scrolls in no way threatened the foundations of Christianity. Because of Allegro's differing ideas on the scrolls and his public statements about them, he was made the target of sharp and unjustified criticism by his teammates who attacked him in the press. And it seemed to me in the reference in that scroll to crucifixion that it brought us much closer to the Christian story, the myth of Jesus. And then when I published this, there was such an outburst, uproar, not least among my colleagues who were afraid of the fear that it would upset people that Jesus was the first prophet to have been crucified or something. Uh, no more than that. The, 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 the links between Jesus and the, the leader of the Essenes were much closer, or could have been much closer than that had that, that been realized, that the uniqueness of the Christian story was a, was a risk that they then wrote a letter to the Times, and I realized then I'd walked into a minefield. But by 1967, Allegro's openness to other ideas had brought him in contact with the works of Professor Ramsbottom of London's Botanical Museum. Ramsbottom is likely the proper founder of the field of ethnomycology. Allegro also came across the works of R. Gordon Wasson, the famous amateur mycologist who is presently credited as the founder of this field of study. These people had suggested that the foundations of Hinduism and early Judaism were based on drug cults that used the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Allegro, based on his deep understanding of biblical lore, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and ancient history and language concluded that the foundations of Christianity could not be any different. I believe that the innocent collection of tales and sayings which was apparently allowed to pass freely among the beleaguered cells of believers in hourly danger of discovery and execution was but a cover story. From that highly improbable account of a gentle rabbi, friend of little children, Roman tax collectors, and ladies with gynecological problems could be distilled by skilled interpreters well versed in the art of rabbinic exegesis as well as the abracadabra of Gnostic mysticism, secret passwords and sayings, the formulae for medicaments and hallucinatory drugs, the therapia in practice and prescription which had earned them their reputation and name of Asaya Essenes, physician.